really know what makes a great city work, you have to peel back its skin and expose its secret life force. A system of incredible complexity and technology that millions depend on but few understand. A fantastic voyage now begins, a journey deep inside the world's mega cities. It's a dot on the map. It's a financial powerhouse living on the shadow of a communist giant. A fly speck on the edge of Asia's largest country. A peninsula bounded by more than 200 islands, only a handful of them inhabited. With more people than the entire nation of El Salvador, Hong Kong is one of the most densely packed cities on Earth. Nearly 7 million people live in an area the size of Tahiti. With real estate scarce, Hong Kong builds wherever it can. On steep hillsides and land reclaimed from the sea. But its true foundation isn't Earth, it's money. Hong Kong has more billionaires per capita than any place on Earth. People here have a knack for making a buck. That's my town, that's my hood. Welcome to Hong Kong. Like the city where he was born, Jackie Chan is a money-making machine. transformed a talent for martial arts into a knockout career as a world-famous movie star. Hi. Now, he's the very face of Hong Kong. I'm the luckiest one. They choose me. They want me to be a uh, tourist ambassador, an Olympic ambassador. Everything. Everything they want. Okay, tell Jackie to do it. Everything. Jackie, represent Hong Kong. Jackie's life parallels the city's progress. He's gone from anonymity to celebrity, from poverty to wealth. In Hong Kong, you have to change to survive, and money buys change. In Hong Kong, it's just like a machine, you know, change, 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 change. I think Hong Kong is the fastest city in the world. When you walk slow, you're behind some other people, then somebody catch you, you're gone, you pass. You have to walk in front of people, then you can success. Only in Jackie's lifetime has his hometown learned to walk in front. One of the main reasons? Hong Kong is blessed with one of the world's great natural anchorages. Victoria Harbour. For centuries, it harbored only fishermen and pirates. Then, in 1839, the British dropped anchor. They turned a rustic village into a crown jewel. A financial juggernaut built on the power of trade. Containers flowed from this port to the far reaches of the world. In 1997, this priceless jewel was returned to China. The British left, but ships still come and go, laden with an ocean of containers. Welcome to the container yards. Hong Kong is the world's busiest container port. So busy, modern terminals dockyard never sleeps. 1,200 employees work in round-the-clock shifts, 365 days a year, moving thousands of containers every day. Container cargo is measured in TEUs, or 20 feet equivalent units, the standard unit in the shipping industry. But general manager Ronnie Chan doesn't see TEUs, he sees dollars. 
This here is the movement of the economy. Last year in Hong Kong, we have 20 million containers going through Hong Kong. And that's containers for food, for raw material, for finished products, all sorts of things. And that's how you keep the economy going. It's also what keeps Ronnie going. This is the little boy's dream. Moving heavy stuff with big equipment. These are what's known as the key crane, my favorite piece of equipment. This is the equipment that makes the money. The key crane is the toy here, but this is a money-making toy. And this is not as simple as it looks. A key crane weighs 900 tons, four times the weight of the Statue of Liberty. It's so heavy, it has to move along the dock on railroad tracks to line up perfectly with a ship. The key cranes should be all ready before the ship comes in meaning that they are all lined up already, okay? If the key cranes are not lined up, it will be late, too late. We'll be losing time. In a place where time is money, not one motion is wasted. See, see this thing going up? Now he won't pull it all the way up and then move over. Now, he, he can do that, but if he would do that, he would lose a lot of time. So a skilled crane operator will always know what's the safe margin, what's the best way to do it so that he can save the time. And if you time it, the next box coming in would be about 30 seconds. And that is fast. That's efficiency. The faster they move, the faster, well, I hate to say this, the money comes in. Modern Terminals is Hong Kong in microcosm. A lean cash cow that never stops producing. Yet a cruel irony once menaced Hong Kong. A sea change that threatened to dry up the flow of money. Imagine borrowing a priceless jewel for a hundred years. For a man, a century is an eternity. You don't worry about returning the jewel. You'll die long before the deadline. But for the world's oldest nation, a century is merely a moment. In 1898, China signed a treaty with Great Britain to lease territories around Hong Kong for 99 years. As the end of the lease approached, China asked for its jewel back. As part of the treaty, China's communist leaders promised not to disturb Hong Kong's capitalists. They call their policy one country, two systems. To Hong Kong, it sounded like two systems, one nightmare. Experts forecast disaster. An island of capitalism swallowed by a sea of communists. Financial markets would panic. The stock market would collapse. The shipping trade would dry up. Worst of all, the city's backbone, its banks, would pack up and leave. Yet, one bank refused to budge. In a bold statement, it declared capitalism was here to stay and made its statement in a billion dollars worth of concrete, steel and glass. 
conceived as the best bank building in the world, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Headquarters is a model of construction. It reinvented the office tower. What makes this building so special is the innovation of Hong Kong's people. We all know technology development was advancing rapidly back then. Manual banking operations became computerized. This building needed to be modernized to keep up with the development. P.Y. Lee has worked here since day one. An engineer in 1985, he now manages the entire tower. Erected on a tiny footprint, the building had to be prefabricated largely off-site. But made in Hong Kong, it wasn't. Like the city itself, the building has foreign components. Steel was made in Britain. Glass in America. A skyscraper built all over the world and shipped in piece by piece. With no margin for error, the precision of the engineering was unprecedented. Simply put, the pieces fit. Some can even be rearranged. We don't have to demolish anything to change the layout. It's like building with Lego blocks. You can easily manipulate any of the pieces. Every interior surface, every wall and floor is movable. So is the building's very infrastructure. Electrical wires, computer cables, air conduits, all can be rerouted without disturbing a single piece of drywall. For example, if the air conditioning system needs to be rearranged, we only have to remove the vent pipe and put it to the other place. Then we cover the vent outlet which is not in use. These designs still consider very technologically advanced. In most buildings, entire floors are occupied by heating and cooling systems. Not here. Instead, those components hang from the building's exoskeleton. In one fell swoop, they can be removed, repaired, or replaced. The jewel in the building's crown is a computer-controlled sun scoop. It's made of 480 huge mirrors that can be configured in 20 combinations. The mirrors gather sunlight and reflect it down through an 11-story atrium. By distributing warmth and light throughout the building, it saves thousands of dollars on electric bills. Impressive as the sun scoop is, it's not Mr. Lee's favorite innovation. This is the document train. Why? Because it's just like the toy cars we played when we were young. It's a huge toy. The document train is actually 120 cars running separately on a single line. Transfer track allows two approaching cars to pass each other, just like real trains. Each car can carry 20 kilograms of paper. Each day, they carry almost 3,000 documents. Fully loaded, they can move the weight of a sport utility vehicle. The train is modeled after a system for delivering parts across a sprawling factory floor. It travels through the skyscraper on 543 meters of track, about the length of two Eiffel Towers laid end to end. Like its toy counterparts, the train runs on electrified track. Grooves within the track hold the wheels fast to prevent derailing. The train is so stable it can carry precious banking documents in any direction, even upside down. Now that's financial security. In Mr. Lee's eyes, this skyscraper achieves the height of perfection. It has to. In a city where land is scarce, there's no room for error. Between the blueprints and the cornerstone, this megacity sometimes consults its own kind of expert. 
So Man Fong is the quintessential Hong Kong entrepreneur. He uses ancient wisdom to influence modern architecture. Feng Shui is the Chinese art of creating the perfect environment. Most famously used in the hideaways of Hollywood, it's about far more than rearranging the living room. It's about harnessing the flow of energy. Feng Shui means wind and water, but its origins lie in the scientific study of space. Feng Shui is about the influence of the nine planets on the Earth. The Chinese people calculated how the sun's rays and the rotation of the planets affected the Earth. The locations that cause sickness, bring wealth, or foster good relationships are calculated by observing the constellations. By analyzing the heavenly and earthly elements of Feng Shui, Master So can determine the most prosperous layout for a room, a building, even an entire city. By nature, Hong Kong is blessed with good feng shui. In the science of feng shui, wide mountains connote wealth. Narrow mountains, poverty. The hills of Hong Kong are rounded and rich. Energy should never flow out of control. In Hong Kong, winds are mild. Victoria Harbour is naturally profitable, wide at the mouth, tapering as it goes. Translation, money flows into Hong Kong faster than it leaves. The harbour itself is large and winding, which gives the city more room to prosper. The result? Wealth. Like a modern stock market, Feng Shui prizes stability and hates uncertainty. Design should follow wind and water, not fight them. Small wonder the heart of Hong Kong, the financial district, goes with the flow. Where I'm standing has the best Feng Shui in Hong Kong. But the best of the best Feng Shui is the HSBC. These two escalators are for the customers. They don't have as good feng shui as the ones used by the bank staff. Therefore, bad luck escalators are for the customers, good luck escalators are for the staff. As a result, the bank can increase its revenue. Besides having good feng shui, HSBC is also an important symbol. All the people who come to Hong Kong look at it. It represents Hong Kong after all. Like the city it symbolizes, the building is a success story. Banks not only stayed in Hong Kong after the handover to China, they thrived. Yet, decades after construction, an urban legend persists. Some say the building is built to be taken apart. The Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank building was designed when skeptics of the handover feared the Chinese army would one day march in. Because bankers hate risk, some people believe this icon of stability has a built-in escape hatch. Legend has it, the design is so clever, the entire building can be dismantled and shipped out. Just in case. In Hong Kong, buildings are so prized because real estate is so scarce. Yet within its finite space, Hong Kong still expands. This mega city builds in all three dimensions. Not just on land, but into the sea and toward the sky. And it's worth any risk. Shirley Sit works without a net. 
She's one of half a dozen women in the entire city who erect bamboo scaffolding. Pressed for space, Hong Kong melds ancient techniques and modern technology to build more room. When there's no more space on the ground, you have to go up. As always here, money is the root of progress. Bamboo isn't just traditional. Bamboo isn't just light. Bamboo is cheap. And like Hong Kong, it's flexible. We use bamboo for construction because of its low cost and high efficiency. And the work can be done very quickly. The whole structure is held together without a single nail or screw. Just plastic ties. If it's tied here and connected to that scaffolding, it won't be shaky. Let me show you. Tightening it, hold it there. Wind it hard until it forms a knot. Tuck it in hard. It will be very tight and stable. It's stable for now. But there's a downside to natural materials. Sometimes the bamboo will be damaged during the rainy season or by strong wind or exposure to the sun. There was one time I dropped a bamboo shoot when I was building a scaffold. It was rotten. I almost fell. Fortunately, I grabbed the scaffolding. Today, Shirley's working on the 60th floor. No safety harness. No trampoline. No parachute. My mentor told me that when I'm on the scaffolding, not to look down. If you look down, you'll be scared. I was quite scared when I first started, but I've been doing it for eight years now, so I'm not scared anymore. The higher you build, the greater the risk. But with so little land, Hong Kong has no choice but to reach for the sky. In its never-ending evolution, this megacity has built a skyline like no other. Look, you never see some other place like that. You know, because we have a small island, you have to build a building one, two, three, four, you know, one by one. It's not like some other country, the city planning. One building, a lot of car park, another building. But in Hong Kong, we have a tiny place. A tiny place with big dreams. To secure its future, this mega city will build like no other. Bridges to the world. If the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Building laid the foundation for Hong Kong's future, this is the Capstone, the newest tower in the International Finance Center. Designed by world-renowned architect Cesar Pelli and completed in 2003, it's the new symbol of this megacity. Welcome to the tallest building in Hong Kong. This is 2 IFC. Uh, I'm the man who built the building. Uh, well, me and about 3,500 other guys. Come and have a look. Project manager David Dummigan oversaw construction from blueprint to ribbon cutting. At 420 meters, number two IFC is the sixth tallest building in the world. Uh, we have uh, 88 stories, 11,000 windows, 62 elevators, and the building weighs in at a mere half a million tons. To build it, they had to move not just heaven and earth, but sea. 
A few years ago, for me to be here, I'd have to be walking on water. Bounded by water, Hong Kong is awash in cash, but short on space. The city couldn't survive with so little land. So they made more. It's called land reclamation. First, engineers built a seawall consisting of a rock foundation and concrete blocks lowered into place from barges. Then, they pumped 700,000 truckloads of sand behind the seawall. As the pile of sand grew, the seawater was naturally displaced. Then, nearly one-third that amount of sand and seabed was removed to dig out the six-level basement, considered the world's largest at the time, and place the tower on solid bedrock. Total area reclaimed from the sea, 20 hectares, almost half the size of Vatican City. Like Hong Kong itself, the project was a model of efficiency. Number two IFC is the heart of a city whose lifeblood is finance. To design the skyscraper, Dummigan and his colleagues studied other great buildings in the world's centers of commerce. The conclusion that we came to there then was that uh, the buildings had changed quite significantly. The biggest change? Function, not form. In the era of electronic banking, computer systems should never go down. A power failure could cost a company millions. In 2IFC we have a dual power supply, power coming in from two se separate sources. We also have backup generators on nine mechanical floors distributed throughout the building. Every room is controlled by computers. What's done manually in other buildings happens here automatically. Engineers thought of everything that could go wrong and built accordingly starting with a space-age command post. Safety and security of the tenants is our number one priority. We have a total of 800 closed-circuit television cameras. All of those cameras can be controlled from here. We have a total of uh, four uh, emergency escape stairs. Those staircases are, are pressurized, which means that even when the doors are open, smoke from a fire on any floor cannot come into the staircase. The tower's elevators travel at a brisk two floors per second, allowing all 15,000 tenants to be evacuated in just 22 minutes. We didn't make them glass because we were afraid that people would get a little bit queasy traveling up the building at eight meters a second. They've anticipated threats from both man and nature. Several times a year, Hong Kong is buffeted by typhoons, with winds up to 240 kilometers an hour. The skyscraper's defense? Giant outriggers. The way these outrigger systems work is actually a bit like a skier, if you can imagine uh, the body of the skier is like the core of the building. Um, the arms of the skier are these great big outrigger trusses and the poles of the skier are like the uh, mega columns and that's what stops the building from falling over in wind. With its visionary construction, number two IFC embodies the forward-looking city itself. So does the building's least functional feature. The fins at the top of the building are designed by Caesar Pelle to represent the fingers of hands and this symbolizes the spirit of the Hong Kong people always reaching for the sky. Number two IFC also stands for something more tangible. Profit. The building was a three billion dollar expense but it's really an investment in this megacity's financial future. We believe that if we had not built uh, this building here in Hong Kong, Hong Kong would have lost some of its edge in the region uh, to our, some of our competitors in the area, like Singapore and more recently Shanghai. 
Number two IFC was built not just to make money, but to house it. The top 14 floors are occupied by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, a pivotal agency in a city that runs on finance. But what truly puts the international in IFC is its link to the outside world. This rail line connects the building to the airport, a straight shot from tower to tarmac. On arrival, visitors can get to the IFC via the express train in 23 minutes flat. So there's no time wasted traveling from the airport into the city, which is a big problem with other major financial uh, centers of the world today. Leaving the IFC, you merge seamlessly into Hong Kong, thanks to a new form of cash that's changing daily life in this mega city. This is my octopus card, which is the card I use to ride on the subway and travel on the buses and buy stuff in the store. The octopus is a combination transit pass and debit card. You can use it not only on buses and subways, but in vending machines drugstores, fast food restaurants, almost any place you'd use cash. The octopus technology can be embedded in cell phones, watches, or jewelry, giving new meaning to the Midas touch. With the octopus card, you don't waste time asking the fare, buying a ticket, or fiddling for change. You scan and go. As it spreads its tentacles across Hong Kong, the octopus is changing the flow of commerce within the city. But the volume of commerce is about to change too. No city built on commerce can remain an island. Hong Kong maintains strong links to the world by sea and air. But now it's forging a new link, an unprecedented feat of engineering. The grand vision, build new bridges of trade throughout the region, and build they will, in a big way. As chairman of the board of the third largest development company in Hong Kong, Sir Gordon Wu has brought modern infrastructure to Southeast Asia. These are the superhighway networks that we do in China. Power stations in the Philippines, power stations in, in China. Now this Hong Kong billionaire is eyeing development in his own backyard. Every time when I see this town here, I see the opportunities, I see the need, the need for a lot more infrastructure. And yet, we still have enormous opportunities ahead of us because of the Chinese economy. All its life, Hong Kong has forged ties to the West. Now, Sir Gordon wants to bond with the East. To him, the Chinese dragon is a cash cow. Just next door, Guangdong province has 10 times the population of Hong Kong. Sir Gordon aims to get a lot more of their business. His avenue, a marvel of engineering. A giant Y-shaped bridge linking Hong Kong to two points in mainland China. This is where Hong Kong is. We are standing here. Now, in the last 25 years, the eastern side of the Delta has developed enormously. But on this side, it's still largely less developed as the eastern side. So we do, if we do get a bridge across, what we can do is to help develop the western side and uh, it'll, it'll make it very viable. Sir Gordon got the idea for his Chinese bridge from America. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, a 23-mile span that was voted one of the seven engineering wonders of the modern world. If the Americans can build something like this in the 60s, I said, well, I'm sure we can do it in the last half of the century. And probably with a better technology and probably a shorter time. When he's through, it may be the eighth wonder of the world. The 
bridge will begin at the tip of Hong Kong's Lantau Island and head across the mouth of the Pearl River. But midway across, the bridge changes course. To preserve a shipping channel, engineers will route the bridge through a tunnel three kilometers long, connected by two man-made islands. Just past the midpoint of its crossing, the bridge becomes a true marvel of engineering. It splits. Y-shaped spans will make landfall in the Chinese cities of Zhuhai, an industrial powerhouse, and Macau, the region's gambling mecca. Total length, 29 kilometers, making it the world's second longest bridge. Laid end to end, its sections could span the entire city of Washington, D.C. When complete, it will close the circle of commerce around Hong Kong and make the city a vital link in the region's trade. true Hong Kong entrepreneur, Sir Gordon sounds confident for a man investing his own money. You know, life is always taking risks. I mean, even if you're having a meal, you might choke to death. So, <laughs> Life is all about risk. But the question is uh, whether it's calculated, whether you have done the sums right, whether the circumstances are correct. I'm going to my restaurant, one of my restaurants. I have a 26th restaurant in town. Think Jackie Chan and you think movie star, not business mogul. But in a city held together by money, it pays to diversify. I have a clothing line, I have a restaurant, I have a movie, I have a camera rental. And besides that, I have a, what? Merchandising, uh, producer some movie, producer some TV program, and I, I forget. It's... That's a, one of my restaurant. Please come. Uh, now just good timing. It's uh, after lunch. It's good. Would you like some dessert? Jackie calls the cuisine fast Japanese seafood. Light fare that fills a Hong Kong appetite. They want fast, they want quick. They sit down, they pick up the food, they pay, they run. Because time is money. Jackie is succeeding where others failed because he added a missing ingredient, change. Before some other people, they almost, they kind of like a bankrupt. Then I take over. Then I take over, I change. I change the model, I change the image, I change the look. The people teach me. I'm learning. I'm not like a movie. Movie, I'm still learning, but business, I'm, I'm just like a beginning. I just like a kindergarten kid. But the kid is a quick learner. And this day, everybody have a telephone, and sometimes they're out of the battery. So you can take your telephone, charge, and charge here. And you lock it. When you finish your, your lunch or finish dinner, then uh, you have a full battery telephone. And I'm thinking about these kind of things. If you want to survive in this kind of business, you have to change. Jackie embodies Hong Kong's success. To become the best, you have to evolve. No change, no progress. Everybody have your, your own style. But when I was young, I, I, I don't know what's my style. And uh, we always copy some other people, you know, when we watch uh, like Bruce Lee film. The first time making an American movie, they, the, the director said, look, I make you like a Clint Eastwood. And when I make a Hong Kong film, look, you, you're going to be a second Bruce Lee. Now, why, why don't I just use my own personality, my own style, Jackie Chan style? Uh, my personality, I want to make fun of people. I, want to, uh, I like humor. I like to make people smiling. And I just might be myself. Then, boom, the movie is just success. Okay, stand by. Ready, roll. And action. To capitalize on his success, Jackie Chan now does more than star in movies. He produces them. 
His production company is making the martial arts film House of Fury. Cut. Today, director Stephen Fong will shoot a few minutes of film. In all, his movie will take months to produce. Yet Hong Kong filmmaking faces a threat it can't fight its way out of. Within hours of release, the film will be stolen, copied and illegally sold for a fraction of the price of a ticket or DVD. Well, the, I think the highest risk definitely is the downloading of uh, like whole movies from the internet. That's the, 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 the thing we fear most. Pirates, the ancient scourge of Hong Kong, are back. Instead of plying the South China Sea, they roam the city's streets in search of the greatest booty of all, intellectual property. I guess it would be the same in the US where people download music. That's the sum of all fear. Hong Kong survived the high seas pirates. It may survive the video version. But now, the most treacherous form of piracy looms. It comes in disguise and threatens to plunder the city of its most treasured safeguard. Money is the ultimate leap of faith. It's a symbol of wealth, not wealth itself. On its own, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Once backed by gold, it's now backed by trust. But in Hong Kong, where money is the key to survival, trust can be bankrupted by a paper-thin wedge of deceit. Counterfeiting. The old Hong Kong currency has been used in Hong Kong for more than 10 years. We thought we needed to add some new anti-fraud features to our new currency. Hong Kong is one of the counterfeiting capitals of the world. But now, counterfeiters have to get past Tak Yan Chan, the moneymaker. His job? Use new technology to safeguard Hong Kong's most valuable piece of infrastructure, the money itself. If time is money, Mr. Chan doesn't waste a minute. In one hour, he can print a quarter billion dollars worth of banknotes. But engineering the notes took two full years. The result? One of the world's best guarded currencies. To understand what makes it so secure, you need a view no one's ever seen. Inside the bills themselves. Among the security features. Ink that changes color as the angle of viewing changes. A metallic security thread woven into the paper with holographic images. A barcode visible only under ultraviolet light. Colored fibers randomly woven into the note also visible only under ultraviolet light. And an iridescent image that appears when the note is tilted under a bright light. The new banknotes are so sophisticated it takes three different machines to print them. One precisely prints the translucent patterns on both sides of the note at the same time. Another gives the notes their texture. The third silk screens the inks that produce different images under variable lights. All these features make the notes highly anti-fraud. In most countries, the government designs and prints the currency. So it is in China, except for the megacity of Hong Kong. Here, currency is created by the city's three largest banks, each with its own design. But one plant prints the notes for all three banks, Hong Kong Note Printing Limited. This is the true money machine. In a typical year, the plant prints about 320 million notes and 
pumps the lifeblood into Hong Kong. The new banknotes do more than safeguard the money supply. They make a statement about the people who use them. Hong Kong people know if you're not working hard enough, you're gone. So I will never give up, always work hard. That's my spirit. Heart and soul of the city are the people. The people here always hustling, always bustling. I think the pace here is faster probably than uh, Manhattan, New York. In this mega city, money changes everything. Continuous improvement. We are never good enough. Never. We are improving every day, bit by bit, but we are moving forward all the time. So every generation getting better, 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 better. That's the Hong Kong spirit. In Hong Kong, the future isn't hard to find. Just follow the money.